Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to a very special edition of See the Futures uh, for Thursday, May 4th. I'm your host, Tom Schneider, CMT with Ninja Trader, and I'm very excited to have our next guest on. But before we get into it, I do want to remind everybody that futures and options trading is not for every trader. You could potentially lose all or even more than all of your initial investment. That's why we recommend you use risk capital. What is risk capital? It's money you can afford to lose, doesn't keep you up at night, doesn't extend your retirement horizon. I also want to remind everybody, past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Also, uh, the information that we're going to talk about in this program is not intended to be trade recommendations nor financial advice, but should be used for educational purposes only. And with that out of the way, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to See the Futures, Chief Economist of the CME, Blue Putnam. Blue, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No, oh, thanks for being here. And I love your backdrop. I got to get one of those with the Ninja Trader logo. It looks so <laughs> great. Um, and I know you're uh, you you're not in your usual location. Where are you where are you calling in from today, Blue? I'm in Chicago today. I'm at the uh, headquarters. Oh, that's great. That's great. Right there on uh, South Wacker, uh, my home hometown. Essentially, same thing. It's great to great that you're there. And I hear the weather's pretty good, right? I brought it for you. Okay. All right. Blue, thanks so much again for joining us. Uh, normally, Jim Cagnino hosts See the Futures, but this week, as we know, talked about this. He is joining uh, so many other people in, in going to the Kentucky Derby. Um, hopefully, we will uh, be able to fill the shoes that Jim holds. But it's great to have you on, Blue, and I've always enjoyed watching you talk to Jim. Um, so, you know, let's just get right into it. Big week this week, right? Oh, big week. <laughs> you know, we got the Fed decision uh, and they did what everybody thought they were going to do. They raised rates and, you know, but, you know, the Fed had this certain, um, you know, like some traders really like big figure numbers. The Fed seemed to like just have to get to five, you know, because as, as far as the economy goes, there's not a whole lot of difference between 4.9 and 5.10. You know, I mean, it really isn't. Uh, but so, you know, but they pushed rates over to five. So they've gone from zero to five and, uh, you know, in about a year, which is a really fast increase in rates, fastest since 1981. And uh, we think, uh, you know, if you listen to Jay Powell and read the press conference and, the, you know, the release, uh, they've hit the pause button, uh, at least for now. Yeah. And that was that was surprising to me um, that yesterday wasn't as volatile. As I thought it was going to be, even with it, it, it being known, 25 basis points rate hike baked in, is, if you could say, we knew it from the Fed uh, uh, watch tool on the CME website. We like looking at that blue, by <laughs> the way, great site. Um, so I, I'm I'm just a little surprised because I've seen it in different uh, times where they rate, they do exactly what they they say they're going to do and there's a lot more volatility but maybe it is because we're we're starting to get into this pivot mode well also some of the press conferences that Jay Powell has held have had a few surprises in them uh this one didn't <laughs> you know he he pretty much stayed on uh the the script uh you know you know they they're making the point that um uh, Hey, they're, they're pausing for now to see how things go, lags in monetary policy, the banking turmoil, things like that. But they're also, uh, you know, way inflation still way above their 2 percent target. Uh, so, you know, he struck a nice balance between uh, we're still fighting inflation, but now we need to see how what we've done is going to impact the economy in the second half of the year. So they really it really was a, a pretty uh, well, well, um, spoken message, if you will, and the market took it fairly well. Uh, but there's more going on in the market than just the Fed. I mean, that, that's why it's a little confusing. Uh, you know, you had Janet Yellen coming out earlier in the week and saying the U.S. could run out of money by June 1. And so that's a that's an overhang on the market as well as what the Fed is doing. And when you say run out of money, you're talking about debt ceiling. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yes. The, uh, the debt ceiling is... Uh, you know, it's $31.4 trillion, which we hit in January, and then they have what they call extraordinary measures to pay all their bills. Uh, but somewhere in June or July, they're not going to be able to pay all the bills. And uh, so that means they have to issue more debt, but they're not allowed to by the debt ceiling. And, uh, 
And then we find out, uh, you know, it, it could be pretty tricky. It could be really tricky, actually. Equities in particular don't like these debt ceiling crises. The last one we had that came down to the wire was 2011. And in the, in the equities fell 19% in the period prior to the, the debt ceiling resolution. Uh, and, by, and back then, equities were not as highly valued as they are today. Uh, interest rates were zero. The Fed was doing quantitative easing. Today, rates are at 5%. The Fed's still doing a little bit of quantitative tightening, and equities have much higher valuations. So, uh, you know, if anything, this debt ceiling crisis would be more severe uh, than 2011. In, in 2011, when they resolved that debt ceiling crisis, <laughs> was it a trade off? I know that one of the things that's uh, being proposed now is. We'll, ra- we'll raise the debt ceiling, but as a consequence of that, we want some cuts, right? We want spending cuts. So it's kind of a trade-off. 2011, I don't remember what happened with the resolution. Did they have well, that the way? Of- yeah, Instead they did. Of- they did not make cuts. What they did in 2011 was agree to a very lengthy period of what they call sequestration, which otherwise meant we're not spending any more money. Uh, okay. So they didn't cut but they remain constant for for quite a few years. And so the budget deficit actually shrunk a lot from 2011 to 2016 uh, because the uh, the expenditures were essentially not growing or growing, you know, just, you know, uh, whereas this time um, the uh, the House of Representatives, the Republican House of Representatives wants to see actual cuts and uh, the the president, uh, the Democratic president in the White House, w- doesn't want wants that to be a part of a budget discussion, but not part of a deficit ceiling, a debt ceiling discussion. So we are at, uh, let's just say we're at loggerheads, and we're more divided than we were in 2011. In 2011, they came down to the last hour. Uh, oh wow! Before they cut the deal. Uh, so who you know? This one is. Uh, <laughs> we're not making any predictions about this one. And and this could go into I think the date is what July is that the the date or well we don't that? know the date uh, Janet Yellen warned that it could be as early as June one uh, but you you got to understand that that if she gave a warning and it turned out to be before that she would be that would not be a good thing uh, so she has to be a little bit conservative June fifteenth is a corporate tax day so the government will get some revenue so if they make it to June fifteenth they probably make it to July um, and after that uh, you know it's going to be pretty pretty close but we don't know the date we do know that um, the tax revenues are running a little bit behind projections we think that's because of the equity downfall last year. So people were taking losses, offsetting gains, and therefore not paying as much capital gains tax. And that would have typically showed up in tax payments in April, and it wasn't there as much as we thought. Uh, but yeah, we're talking probably somewhere around the third to uh, third week of June to early July, but it could be a little earlier, as Janet Yellen warned. It's, and, and that's so interesting. You've put together a couple of things that I think you hear talked about in the news and, uh, you know, capital gains tax, uh, you know, a bear market last year. How does that how is that going to affect debt ceiling? You know, putting it together. I would never put it together, Blue. So uh, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> well, and the other you know, thing about the let me one thing on the debt ceiling that people don't understand. We talk about it as a default on the Treasury debt. But it's really way much more than that. And that's why the equities get very worried going into these crises. Uh, When you have a budget crisis and you shut down the government, you're really only furloughing about 800,000 people. And when it's over, you give them all their back pay. And it's not really that big a deal. The debt ceiling is a whole different story because the U.S. Congress has never prioritized who gets paid. So when you have to not pay someone, who do you not pay? Well, no one wants to make that choice. I mean, you know, are you not going to pay Social Security? Oh, maybe I won't pay my veterans. Oh, well, I don't know. What about Medicare? You know, or do I pay the Treasury debt? Nobody wants to make those priority decisions. And Congress has provided no guidelines whatsoever for the Treasury Department to do that. So that's why if we hit the debt ceiling and we run out of money, 
it might be a very big crisis for the economy because no one would get paid. Do you think that's something that could be resolved through Congress uh, setting those rules? Okay, we dodge a bullet. Let's say they pull out a deal. They dodge a bullet this time. It's in their rear view. They don't even think about it. Or, you know, it's it's a once in a decade event. Let's deal with it when we come to. Or it seems like those safety measures should be in place at the very least so we know who we're going to pay when we can't pay people. Well, you're trying to be reasonable. Uh, that's that's not a hallmark of a, a divided Congress. Uh, you know, I mean, we raised the debt ceiling three times when uh, Trump was president. We've raised it when Democrats have been president. So it, it really is a divided politics now that's causing this. Uh, and, you know, that's not my uh, sphere of expertise. So uh, I'm going to be watching this theater like everybody else. But it does look like it's going to be a nail biter. Sure, sure. So another thing that's come up, I think, that um, is relatively new or doesn't happen often, of course, is the fiscal, the the bank crisis, right? So can you can you talk a little bit more about, you know, maybe uh, maybe not so much Powell's comments yesterday, but Janet Yellen's comments about the bank crisis? Well, the bank crisis this time around was really different from two thousand eight. In 2008, it was a subprime mortgage crisis. It was on the credit side of banks. Um, the, the economy had peaked a year earlier, and we were starting to see some unemployment rises. Some people on those subprime mortgages were starting to default on their loans. Banks had made way too many of these things. Um, <clears throat> this time around, it was a liability crisis. So we're on the opposite side of the balance sheet. Um, we did have, uh, you know, some of the banks had taken very large positions relative to the treasury market. So that's not a credit issue at all. It's a positioning issue. And then they started to lose deposits, which is the liability side. Uh, so it's a very, very different uh, banking turmoil than we had in 2008. Uh, and we, we don't really know how it'll play out. But if you're a regional bank and you've lost deposits for whatever reason, your loan book may be solid, but your loan to deposit ratio is not what you want anymore. So you're going to cut back your lending. And, uh, you know, we're going to see some lagged effects of this as we work through the second half of the year. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's that to me seems like um, more of the, it's on the banks more than uh, the Fed, let's say, uh, but these regional banks maybe investing in the wrong kind of instruments uh, with with very little foresight, right? With, you know, you're no, going no, into I don't it. Want, I don't want to go quite there, you know, because certainly there were some of the regional banks that have been in the headlines that had uh, questionable business models. But the typical regional bank loans to local real estate people, you know, commercial real estate, residential real estate, they are loan to whatever industry they're in, it's, whether it's farming or stuff. Their loans are not the problem. Uh, it's their deposits that have left because of the run on the on the banks that, that that's causing them to cut back. Now, they do have a little bit of a problem with valuation. Over the last decade, interest rates stayed pretty close to zero. And so you made a lot of loans at lower interest rates. And so the value of the loans in their portfolio isn't what you would probably want. But the credit quality is fine in almost all the banks, except a few that were in the venture capital and other things like that. But the typical regional bank, it doesn't have a problem with credit loss. They have a problem with the valuation and a problem with their liabilities because they've lost some deposits. Understood. Well, thanks for that, Blue. I, I do want to talk about um, getting back to the Fed decision and and kind of comparing that to the European Central Bank decision today, um, how that might play out in, let's say, currency markets with the euro effect specifically. Yeah, the, the European Central Bank and actually the Bank of England, too, are in a somewhat more difficult position than the Federal Reserve. The, the core inflation rate in the United States, at least based on the measure that the Fed likes, which is the uh, PCE core, um, it's just a hair below 5%. They've got interest rates a little, you know, at 5%. So that they've matched the core rate of inflation. And we're, we're 
you know, we feel relatively confident that that number will, the core inflation rate will drift down a little bit. We can come back to that topic. But in Europe, the core inflation rates are a percent or two higher. In England, they're even a little higher than that. And these countries, particularly the European Central Bank, they started late. Uh, they actually started from negative rates, you know, so they started in a hole. Uh, and they've been a little slower. So even though they've ra- they're raising rates now, they have more to do and they're further behind the curve. Uh, and so, you know, you might think, well, if the Fed pauses and the European Central Bank raises rates, why doesn't the euro get stronger? And it, it might. But, you know, they, they are behind the curve and their interest rates are still below what's in the U.S. and their inflation rates are higher. So they're in a difficult spot. Uh, they're, they're not remotely done with the work they need to do. In your estimation, are they taking the same tack that the Fed is in, in dealing with inflation, at least in the same path? Because I know Bank of Japan, very different way of, <laughs> of dealing with inflation, right? But um are we are we looking at Bank of England, uh, European Central Bank, even uh, the RBA, NZA? Are they all taking kind of the same approach that the Fed is? It's just a little bit delayed. Well, their rhetoric is fairly similar. They they have shifted to a total inflation fighting rhetoric, but their context is different. Um, you know, the European Central Bank runs the money supply, the monetary system for all those European countries in that group. Uh, and they have to worry about different countries, different factions and so forth. It's a much difficult problem. It's why they got off to a late start. Uh, they're going to be more cautious. The, uh, the UK has the overlay of the Brexit problem. Brexit problem hit the UK much harder than the people that brought Brexit to the UK thought it would. It's, it's, it's created a lot more inflation. So the context really matters, but the rhetoric from the central bank is fairly similar. We're going to be, we're going to fight inflation. That's their mantra. But the inflation problem is worse in Europe and in the UK, more difficult. And as I said, they're behind the curve, so they got to do some more. So that, that you know, that's that's great to to you know think about when we talk about currencies and you're you're trading the euro FX currency on the CME or you're trading the British pound future on the CME. Um, you know, I always look at these days on a Wednesday and a Thursday for the euro, you know, you could have two very volatile days based on, you know, two separate events, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, you know, different stages of where they are fighting inflation could have very different uh, meanings, but ultimately results, I think, in volatility in, in the in specifically euro FX. Yeah, and, and the yen is a whole different animal altogether. The Bank of Japan has the easiest monetary policy going. They haven't done a thing, <laughs> okay? <laughs> They're just waiting for inflation to slow down. But the, the yen has a tendency to rise to gain value when equity markets sell off around the world. So there, there's a different dynamic with the yen uh, and, and, of course, a totally different central bank policy. They They would like to see inflation... Uh, stay around. They don't want it at three or four percent. They'd rather have it at two. But uh, but but they spent several decades trying to get inflation higher. Well, they were at zero, and they didn't like that. And so they they've taken a rather different approach. Uh, but again, that in today's market, that's overlaid against the yen uh, rising if global equities has a bad day. So you you got more than one thing going on. Right, right, and it comes back like you know, almost tied back to the dollar is kind of the central piece of this, right? Yeah, I mean, everybody's trading relative to the dollar, but it's interest rates relative to U.S., it's growth relative to U.S., and it's risk relative to the U.S. And that's where the debt ceiling comes in because it raises the risk of the U.S. We're not used to thinking of the U.S. as a risky country, but when you when you, uh, you know, play around with the, the uh, whether you're going to pay your debts or not, well, that makes you a risky country, period, you know. And, and we sure. may get over it very quickly, but that's what, you know, you have to consider these things in the market. And, and so with that in mind, as we get to the point where we learn more about the debt ceiling and more about how they're handling it and possibly even about a deadline, we might see these other asset classes maybe experience a little bit of lift if there's uncertainty. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but you might see these currencies, 
the uh, gold possibly uh, uh, get a little bit of a lift if there is uncertainty about the debt ceiling, especially if we get closer to the deadline? Is that something you might yeah, say? Yeah, the gold is definitely, uh, you know, had a rally in part because of the debt ceiling. Uh, you know, but but you got to, this is really difficult for traders. You just have to understand that the amount of volatility we could have in June and July, it's not going to be a quiet summer. Uh, and and this is not about, uh, you know, people like me that follow the economics. This is about the politics in the U.S. And, you know, get me out of here. You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> right. Good luck with that. Um, and, and it's only going to get more intense, I think, as we start to enter election season uh, this summer. Um, is there anything about what Powell said yesterday uh, that did surprise you? You said it was he was pretty much on key with his message. He didn't see seem anything. There wasn't anything surprising, but he did say a lot of stuff. And, and the one thing that I thought they kept asking him about his view on a recession versus what different you know, different reports that maybe the the Fed or different banks in the Federal Reserve System have put out might be at odds. Yeah, I mean, there's a diverse set of opinions about whether we're going to have a recession or not. Uh, the, the yield curve is a very good, when it inverts, when short-term rates are higher than long-term rates, it's a pretty good predictor of future recessions. You don't have to have one. Um, but typically, uh, the yield curve inverted last October, November. Um, and uh, Typically, it takes uh, at least a year and, and sometimes a year and a half or more before that recession actually occurs. So, you know, if you're a follower of the yield curve, uh, you, you're starting to get worried about the uh, second half of 2023, early 2024. The, the, the markets are clearly worried about that. Uh, the federal funds futures uh, is pricing in uh, cuts in rates in the second half of the year and into 2024. And, and so that's a more pessimistic view of. Um, what might happen to the economy. The Federal Reserve is uh, is data dependent. He made that absolute, Jay Powell made that clear several times uh, in, in the press release and in the, the press conference. What data dependency means, it means you're driving your car looking through the rear view mirror. Uh, so you're going to get your information with a lag, uh, but you really don't want to be a forecaster in this kind of an environment. And so the, the Fed is saying, look, we've done a lot. We, did, we need to wait and see what's happened. And, and so that's a pretty reasonable view. But you do have to remember that the data comes with a month lag and, and, and sometimes more. And, it, you know, it's a, it's a backward looking view. So if we do get some interest uh, in, you know, unemployment rising, things like that, which I'm not sure is going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm more in the glasses half full camp here. But uh the Fed has definitely gone data dependent. The markets are more like, ah, we're going to slow down more than you think. So there's a big uh, debate going on. It's going to be, if I can change the subject slightly, there's going to be another debate developing. And that's how low inflation actually goes. We know inflation's coming down. But prior to the pandemic, from 1994 to, 2000, to 2020, that's 25, 26 years, we averaged 2% core inflation. And we were really, I think we got to 3%, we got down to 1%, but we were really in a narrow trading range for 25 years. Um, my message to you is that had nothing to do with monetary policy. Um, what it had to do with was three things. Globalization, we low cost supply chains. Well, that's gone away. We're, we're doing supply chains now for resiliency, that costs more. It had to do with technology, expanding the internet. That empowered com consumers to be comparison shoppers. Now, that doesn't go away, but the gains are all done. There's nothing else to get from that. Uh, and then we had demographics. Back in the 1990 and even early 2000s, the baby boomers were still working, and we had a growth in the young people. Today, baby boomers are retiring, and the percentage, the growth of young workers coming into the labor force is close to zero, no growth. So the demographics are a headwind for inflation. So all of the things that gave us two and a half decades of low inflation are gone. And so from my point of view, we're, we're, we're going to, inflation's going to come down some more, I, I definitely. But, uh, but, you know, where does it settle? Probably more closer to 3 to 4% than 2 
And so that means that the central banks are going to have to keep rates higher longer or, you know, cause a recession. So it's going to be a very interesting second half of the year 2024. Right. And, and you know, we know that the target is 2%, 2 to 3% is what the Fed has been saying. If we don't quite get there and they don't adjust their thinking about why, right? They're looking at the standard, whatever the 12 or 17 or, or, you know, whatever that group of data is, and it just isn't working, you know, maybe 3% is normal. 4% is normal for a while because of the reasons you just said. Demographics is a huge thing. And we're actually one of the good countries that has pretty good demographics comparatively with the other big, you know, global partners we have. Well, we're, I wouldn't know that we have headwinds from demographics, but we are a little bit uh, behind Japan. We're behind China. They, their demographic headwinds are even more serious than ours. The countries, of course, that have favorable demographics are largely in Latin America, India, Africa, places like that. And if they stabilize their politics and their economic system, they could have some pretty good growth years. Right, right. And, and you know, getting back to the Fed, you know, I, what I thought was interesting, Powell, of course, he has, I think he's been pretty consistent with saying, we'll follow the data, we'll look at the data. And certainly the other Fed presidents have been saying that as well along the way. Um, you know, I think what was interesting, he did mention the lag effect as well, which I haven't heard too much about that from him in past statements. Now, I might just not have been listening as close, but uh, it seems like he acknowledged the lag effect Um pretty much up front in the yesterday's statements. Well, you know, prior to yesterday, the Fed wanted to be as tough on inflation as they could. They were still planning to raise rates. So whenever you talk about the lag effects, some people in the market think, oh, you're about to pause. So that was not in his vocabulary until now. Once you pause, you're allowed now to talk about lag effects. You're allowed to talk about the banking system having some credit tightening of its own. You know, so, you know, he's got a whole different narrative now. Uh, his, his new narrative is we've done a lot of work. Now let's see how it's, how it's going to come out. Whereas before his narrative work was we have more work to do. So, right. you know, the story, uh, you know, the story's changed and, uh, but, but I will tell you that we, we generally take uh, the, the steps up on interest rate and we take the elevator down. And that's partly because of this data dependency. By the time you realize you're in a recession, you've already been in one for a couple of months. And so you have to be a little more aggressive. Uh, but certainly today's data shows zero signs of recession. Well, that's, that's good news. That's great to hear. I think um, going back to that Fed, um, the matrix on the uh, Fed tool at the CME website, you know, they're looking at, uh, I would say, accelerated cuts, um, consistent cuts, almost as soon as the next meeting or the meeting after. I think it's the meeting after. Uh, what are we the in? The meeting We're after, but uh, yeah. yeah, you're you're really looking at a pretty consistent uh, set of cuts is what the federal funds futures are telling you. So you can go to that FedWatch tool. You can look at the next four or five meetings, see what the probabilities look like and the interest rate. The probabilities are all getting for lower, lower rates. Um, by the way, the, the federal funds rate is 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 pricing the cost of risk management. Uh, it, it, uh, we're not saying it's a, a great predictor because, you know, markets can be wrong about lots of things, as we all know. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's if, if you're, you know, you're setting, you're looking at what are the markets telling me, that's your b benchmark for managing risk, uh, is that, that, you know, the Fed's going to stay tight, but then they're going to realize there's a recession. But again, I'm not in that. The recession doesn't have to happen. We, we're uh, we're coming out of the pandemic. We're still gaining jobs in leisure and hospitality. We're losing jobs in tech and Wall Street. But, you know, the labor force is still growing and I mean, not the labor, the um, the payrolls are still growing. So we're not uh, the, the signals are flashing warning from like the yield curve. But the data doesn't show it yet. Well, that's good to know. And before we leave, Blue, I want to thank you again. I know um, your time is very valuable and you, you've got a tight timeline today, but I will ask you, because Jim is at Kentucky and he needs a little help sometimes, <laughs> I, do you have any advice for Jim as, as far as maybe the race or what to do in, in Louisville? 
<laughs> I have no advice on what to do in Louisville. Uh, you know, I live in Washington, D.C., so, you, you, you know, uh, I'm thinking about the Preakness. Uh, and he can worry about the Derby. <laughs> there you go. And I've got the Belmont covered. I'm in New York. So yeah, there you go. Uh, the three of us, we have it. We Blue, got the I triple thank- crown. That's right. We'll do it. And um, I want to thank you for coming on and, uh, you know, lending your wisdom and, and your uh, advice or, or your information. I shouldn't say this was advice. Nothing here should be taken as advice. <laughs> this is for entertainment and educational purposes only. But I, I do really want to thank uh, from everybody here at Ninja Trader working on the show, Mission Control, Mike Burke and uh, Jim. Um, thank you. We extend that to you. Uh, oh, thank for you. It's always show. fun. Always fun. All right. Thanks. Safe trip home. And I want to uh, say to the viewers, thanks for watching. Mike Burke will be back at bars closing to close out the day. In the meantime, have a great trading day.